30 years ago, Jurassic Park roared its way into movie theaters. The film's impressive special effects and incredible premise have wowed audiences for decades, cementing it as a true classic. It took several years to craft the perfect blockbuster. It all began with the script writing process, adapting Michael Crichton's science fiction story into an adventure for the big screen. As scripts were written, the production's art department immediately began illustrating various sequences and sets. These vital pieces of concept art, blueprints, and storyboards helped visually shape the film and its large budget. One vital member of this team was Caroline Quinn, the film's art department coordinator. While her career would later evolve as a set designer on projects like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Halloween Kills, and Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon, Jurassic Park was where everything began. Join us now as we discuss her role as an art department coordinator and the adventure she went on to help bring Jurassic Park to life. So it is now, believe it or not, the 30th anniversary of Jurassic Park, which is mind blowing, right? Especially for you, because you worked on it. <laughs> oh, uh, it's just, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't compute. It so, it's, that doesn't compute. I mean, it, it seemed like a long time ago, for sure. Uh, but, um, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That's a long time. Three decades. So yeah. uh, here we are. Yeah. Still <laughs> here we talking are. about it. <laughs> Like, it just won't go away, damn it. it. just won't go away, this damn movie that everyone well, loves so much. <laughs> when I first started working on it, and I was, I was talking to Rick Carter, it was really early days. I was hired by Rick, uh, bless his heart, who's a very, uh, he's kind of on a set, on another channel than the rest of us. And so I came on uh, almost out of art school with no qualifications to work on a movie, but he liked my portfolio of fine art that I produced at school and I was trying to get, you know, I wanted to be in the business. And so I was brought on really early just by chance, by luck, lucky timing, you know, knowing somebody. And I remember Rick, we were walking around one day and he said, you know, this is gonna be a really historical movie, just so you know. And I'm, I'm like, okay, <laughs> if you say so. Um, so yeah, here we are, uh, he was right. And that was really early on. That was really early on. So uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's kind of fascinating that Rick already knew that it was going to be a big deal. He must have seen perhaps some of the ILM tests or something. Yeah, I mean, it was so early. I came on and I had n really no very little knowledge about the business. I had no business being there, but I was super lucky to be there. And I still suffer from imposter syndrome because of that. Um, because I was like, well, what am I doing here? And I also had no idea where, what my place was. So I was a bit of a brat. There was Rick Carter. Um, Jim Teagarden was the art director. And uh, when I came on, there was just one illustrator, Tom Cranham. And I think they'd already been working on it for a few months. And there was Marty Klein was another illustrator who'd done some work. And I think one more super famous guy, David uh, not David Lowry, but somebody else, some really amazing illustrator. And so they had all these concept drawings and they'd been talking to ILM and they'd been talking to Stan Winston. And so they had kind of an idea where they were going, but they had no idea where they were going because they hadn't, didn't have the, ILM didn't have, it was, you know, creating these computer graphics as they were going. And Stan Winston was kind of, you know, doing his thing. And um, they'd already gone through a couple of, you know, scripts, I think. And so basically it was just me, Rick and Tom for, I don't know how many months. 
And, and then people started coming in and doing drawings, uh, set designers and more, a couple of, maybe one more art director. And I think we were on, we were in the back bungalows, uh, which have probably all gone, well, definitely all gone now, behind Andlin. There were some bungalows there, some, um, you know, uh, temporary trailers. I, I had no idea. I had no idea. I was in this little little world next to Amblin. And I'd been on it for a few months. And, and I said, as I said, I was a real brat and I didn't know my place. And I was upset because I was I didn't understand my job. I really didn't know what I was doing. And I was upset that I wasn't doing more interesting things. So I think and, and I think I was crying. <laughs> I was telling Rick that I was really having I had a bit of a I had a bit of a tantrum with Rick. And, you know, Rick has had small children at the time. So he was probably used to it. Bless him. Um and and so, but I, I I was also at that time using spray glue, spray seventy seven, and and gluing all these storyboards and illustrations onto 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 illustration board for a presentation. So I had the mask on, and I got, and that's probably why I was upset because I was having to do this this job, and I was just not happy. So I had this mask on, and I was been spraying, and I had goggles on just because it was all this stuff was billowing up, and and I had had this tantrum, and then. Steven Spielberg comes into the art department to have a quick meeting with Rick. And I hadn't met him at that point. And um, Rick says, oh, here, come, Caroline, come meet Steven. And I went, hi, nice to meet you. And I, and I had all these red eyes because I'd been crying. He says, oh, you are right? And I said, oh, it's okay. I've been wearing all these masks and goggles because I've been spraying. So I was able to sort of pass off. I passed it off. Like the swollen eyes weren't caused by the, by the glue. It was because I was being a brat. Oh, no. I know. Well, at least it didn't come off that way to Steven. There you go. So that's fine. <laughs> you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> See, he just thought you were a hard worker, is all. That's, that's right. Great. That's, that's right. right. Well, I was. Perfect. I was. I was. <laughs> After a few months, it uh, they announced that it was shutting down. ILM needed some time. So they shut down, and then we all went to work on Death Becomes Her. So then my first real experience of a full movie was Death Becomes Her, also at Universal. We just moved offices. And then after that finished, we all started coming back to Amblin to continue Jurassic. Death Becomes Her was sandwiched in between. So, Yeah, it's interesting that that ended up happening. Like even Spielberg went off to go and do Hook um, right. during that time period, right? And, so. it, and it, all, it, it does all kind of merge together in my head because I didn't work on Hook, but I knew people who did, obviously, in the art department. And I went to visit the Hook the giant soundstage where they were shooting the ship. Oh, but wow. It was at Sony. <laughs> so that was my first time visiting Sony was just to go visit them on Hook. So, so yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. Oh, that must have been an incredible set to see the big, the big ship set, right? So that's... Yeah, yeah the oh whole stage, God. you could just walk around. It was like, you know, you know, on, a, on, on various heights of platforms and you would just kind of walk around these gangplanks and up into this area and down into this area and ropes. And I just remember ropes and, you know, crazy, craziness. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, did you ever get to visit the Jurassic sets? All the time. I was, because I was such a brat, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't really interested in the job I was supposed to be doing, which I really didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. But I, you know, as the outcome coordinator, I, I ended up doing a lot of research. Um, and, um, you know, as well as being sort of the general sort of dog's body for the art department and sitting right, my desk was right by the door at Amblin. So I used to see people coming and going all the time, um, you know, really like George Lucas, which is stroll past my desk and uh, Bruce, I met Bruce Dern. I met Chris, uh, Laura Dern came in one day and I was like, and I was chatting with Bruce Dern. It's like, oh, all right, this is kind of fun. So in between all my, you know, the work I was supposed to be doing, I would all I would go to stage because I would have to go to stage and deliver stuff, you know, deliver documents and things or go send a message to somebody. So I would end up on stage a lot. So I did see a lot of the I was there for a lot of the shooting, you know, on and off at Warner Brothers and Universal. So it was really quite something. I saw the um, the big Stan Winston T-Rex. I used to go I was friends with the Stan Winston guys. So I used to go to Stan Winston studio and hang out there you know, they were good friends of mine. So I saw a lot, a lot of those dinosaurs being worked on, being figured out and all the robots and uh, it was great. It's really cool. 
No, oh, that's pretty cool. Were, were you ever there to actually see the scenes actually being shot, or were you just kind of like shoot away, like no, <laughs> you can't um, be here? No, for this. I mean, I think maybe I think it's all changed now. That's the that's the shame of it. I think, especially now with all the COVID protocols, being on set is a whole different thing. But I was, you know, everyone. I, I kind of knew any, everybody. I was really, really wanted to meet everyone. So I was, re I kind of knew a lot of the different crew members. Um, and I would just, you know, look over their shoulder, whether it's the sound guy or the video video guy or the gaffers. I mean, I was sort of had knew all of them. I don't know how it happened, but I did. And because we all did Death Becomes Her and we all did Jurassic Park and they were all kind of all over the place doing that. They were all there doing Casper at the same time and uh, as, as the Flintstones. So it's like this kind of big, you know, big, small world of people. So, yeah, I was watching... Um, you know, I, I remember distinctly the scene where it's raining and it's dark and who's the guy, the bad guy who stole the uh, samples? He was... Oh, Dennis Nedry? Yeah, he was standing on the edge and that whole thing where he's like near... There was a whole thing with on the cliff face. I just remember the cliff and the car and a dinosaur and it kind of does... It was a long... It was a long time ago. Did you ever do any like artwork yourself for the production or were you more just like assisting with the other uh, artists? Um, you know, I wasn't sort of, I, I Rick, uh, again, because he's just such a good guy. He, he asked me to do a few little things here and there because I wasn't in the union. I couldn't do any drawings and I had no, I'd had no, at that time, I was not a set designer. I had no skills on set designing, but um, I was, I did make some, a few little sort of models of like areas with dinosaurs to help you know just just concept models and of rocky scenes with uh clay but nothing you know i it wasn't my job or my position to uh do anything for the movie official <laughs> so oh i see that makes sense yeah a lot of research and this is obviously before uh internet existed uh, at least you know on the consumer level like that like for us so I had to call up, and I hate the telephone. I really don't like being on the phone. But anyway, I would have to call up people from like I went to Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I call. I went to Caltech, and I could. I had to call someone. I know, didn't know who to call, and maybe I'd been given a name or somebody to contact. So I would just have to call call, call these people and and uh, ask them if they would let me come over and take photos. So I went to JPL. And asked because I was asked, I was asked to find out if there was anywhere like a robotic arm. And I this must have been for the lab with the eggs, right? They had robotic yeah. stuff going on. So I need I was asked to research what those in if there are any out there in the real world. And could I please, you know, could you go please go to get some photo, you know, get some research on them? So and there weren't that many books around. And I would try and I would look at all the research libraries and go to libraries and you know, see, do what I could do. And then I was like, okay, I'm just going to go and find out what's out there for myself. So I went to JPL and then Caltech was to look at all the supercomputers there. Um, they had a lab full of like, you know, the uh, ginormous computers that they wanted to see um, what they looked like. I took photos of their lab and computer lab and, you know, all, all those little things, all those details that um, all the uh, designers, set designers have to sort of use to help them design the look of the movie and what's yeah, going on. Yeah, and that's really important stuff because, I mean, especially, you know, when they're trying to create a very realistic looking park, you know, they have all the, you know, animatronics, you know, like I said, like in the lab sequences to actually look like it's something that could exist. So it's not just, you know, fanciful, you know, so he actually helped make that be you know, more realistic movies. That's really cool. I forgot. I went down to San Diego to the zoo or the wildlife park, one of the two. Um, and I took photos of that because it was the it was the one that has is more natural surroundings. There's like the one that's a bit more typical zoo like and then there's the one that's more natural. And so I went down to that one and I took photos of that and went up on the gondola and like, you know, took photos of the enclosures and all that stuff and brought all that back too. So that was my little fun day out i guess <laughs> oh that's really cool though i mean it's almost like you're on your own little safari of your own taking photographs of everything so it's pretty fun it was really super cool it was really good it was like very intense sort of research based work i was doing for a while just trying to get help everybody yeah 
No, that's great. I mean, did you ever go into Universal Studios Hollywood, the theme park itself, to use that as reference for like rides or anything? You know, I I don't know if we did. I mean, for everybody, it was just up the hill, so it could ever, anybody could go there at any time to go look. So I'm and and I'm sh- pretty sure some uh, some of the the art department staff had probably even worked on the some of those theme park rides themselves as as, as designers. So it didn't, it was something it was, you know, it was unnecessary for me to go up there because it literally it was just up the hill. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. I mean, I know they once contacted Bob Gurr, who did the, you know, confrontation, like the animatronic King Kong that used to be at the park, you know, before the fire burn it down. Because so I know he was, I guess, at least approached to work on Jurassic Park, but ended up, you know, being Stan Winston instead. So yeah, I'm sure they had some intel with, you know, someone like him for maybe some of those kind of details too. So that's pretty cool. And I, I remember you sent um, pictures uh, to me when I was talking to your husband, Seamus Blackley, you're in the little Amblin golf carts and everything. Right. So like, you're just right. kind of on the move, right? So that's great. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was, it was it was great. I had a friend visit from England, my one of my oldest friends. He was visiting uh, LA for a, a holiday, and I said, "Oh, he, he said oh, I'm going to come to Universal and you know do the tour." I said, "Well, I'll come and pick you up at the gate." So I, I rolled up in the Amblin <laughs> golf cart, and his, his jaw nearly touched the ground. <laughs> it's like, "Hi!" <laughs> so you guys on like VIP tour from you? That's pretty cool. That's right. That's right. <laughs> They had a couple of like beige jeeps for staff crew to use, and so at the weekends when everyone go home, uh, we could borrow them. So I won, you know, a couple of weekends I signed up at one of their jeeps and <laughs> was driving around. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> No, that's great. I can only imagine like to have that kind of freedom on such a you know prestigious place, especially at the time. I mean, you were working there during like the golden years of that studio, really, where everything was happening. Yeah, well, yeah, one of them. I mean, I don't, yes, it was definitely a special time. It's definitely a special time, especially with Amblin in that that whole, um, I was, I, I mean, you know, I was, I look back and I think, oh my God, I was so lucky. I was so lucky to be there. And it was, um, you know, it just, it just doesn't exist anymore. It just doesn't exist, that kind of system the the and the, the camaraderie and all the the groups of people who would just work together all the time because everything's just so spread out now and so yeah like filming in like parts of canada georgia the uk so it's like everywhere there's trying to i guess nickel and dime like oh, where's the cheapest place at the moment that we can go to right, right. in that yeah. scene so that's yeah. that is sad but yeah Again, at least you were able to experience, you know, the better time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) During the production of Jurassic Park, you know, they do a lot of preliminary tests to, you know, kind of figure out what the sequence is going to be like before they even film it. And one of those sequences that I know the production spent a lot of time on was the raptors in the kitchen sequence, which was very complex. I found this test footage where you were playing... Lex Murphy, the little girl, and uh, art director John Bell was playing Tim Murphy. Right. And then some other people were playing the Raptors. And it's this very, you know, crudely shot, but very effective test of what that sequence could be like. And it had a lot of interesting ideas that didn't even make it into the final cut, but other things that did. Right. So how did that all come about? Like, what was it like (laughs) to Uh film that? Yeah, I don't know. I get. I guess me and John got got volunteered to to do it. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll do it. That sounds fun. But yeah, they had to. I mean, they had to spend a little bit of time collecting all those boxes. So they had to like, you know, get appliance boxes, all the cardboard boxes, and uh, they f- sort of filled the stage with them. And so one day, you know, I just went down there with John, and 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 as he was the art director, so he was involved with it. I was just kind of, you know, on, uh, tagging along. Dennis Muren was the uh, DP and from ILM, and Stan Winston was the director. And, oh, or really? The around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had Stan Winston and Dennis Muren, these titans of the business, directing us on this this little shoot. And they had two guys from um, Stan Winston Studios were dressed in the raptor. Well, they had maybe they had one raptor suit guy, and I can't remember his name, but I remember what his face. I remember his face. Um, so he was one of the raptors and I think they had maybe like a two-dimensional stand-up one that they would kind of like jig along. Yeah, like a cardboard um, cutout kind of thing. Right, yeah. yeah. They, <laughs> oh, 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 
before. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we had to crawl out, crawl, crawl along the floor um, in various shots, and uh, you know, I mean, they 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 followed it fairly closely in the movie. As, you know, I I was there when they were like figuring out, yeah, the mirror when the when the raptor flies into the mirror, uh, or it's the shiny stainless steel metallic surface yeah yeah, yeah something <laughs> something reflective they all figured it out there and uh i was sort of blocking mechan mechanism to help them figure it all out so well, and, and it was like, helpful <laughs> i can imagine because i mean you know storyboards can only do so much which is why you know they do you know i guess what they still call animatics today where they have either like a like a cgi model usually these days kind right. of figuring it out yeah. but you know um they didn't have that back then so you know they had things like test reels well, like had, what you guys they did. had video they had um they ha and i think i have a copy of one because when we all shut down all this stuff was kind of left over in the art department and and, and it was just going to get thrown out so i kept some of it and i have um a binder of uh shots of a, like a, some preliminary storyboards they did of, of just videoing like just models like little you know models and a little car turned over for the t-rex scene so i have a lot of storyboards and then interspersed with with um you know illustrator storyboards like from dave lowry's work so it's kind of this mishmash of of just they had books and books of these things just and, and they had little screenshots of like little video shots that were part of this these storyboards so uh yeah it was all this you know obviously very very highly sort of studied scenes because they had all this they had to somehow merge and I, I, thinking back, because I didn't really understand at the time, they had to merge the physical Stan Winston stuff with the digital ILM stuff. They ho were hoping for more Stan Winston stuff than ILM stuff, and then it ended up being more ILM stuff than Stan Winston stuff. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. Well, I mean, I guess that's a way for them to have like a cost-cutting measure to test these things out and to make those determinations of what is going to be done by what. So they don't have to waste their money as much as possible. Right. But yeah, I mean, it is pretty cool how like close the Raptors scene was when you, you know, played it out. Uh, the the big difference um, was at the very end where in, in your test version, there's a guy that comes into the kitchen. Yes. And he has like some knife or grabs some knives and then he right. fights the Raptors. I'm <laughs> like, oh, that's not in the movie. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was um, one of the set designers, John Berger. Was, that was his role that day. <laughs> And I, doesn't he like to have a tray and he drops the tray and he like yeah. looks, he has to look surprised and then he's laughing. <laughs> but yes, that did that didn't make it into the movie. <laughs> yeah, that was such a mystery to me. I'm like, who is that supposed to be? Because I even checked the scripts and like that never happens in any of the I, I, For some reason, my my brain is telling me it was meant to be a, a cook, a chef. Yeah, that makes sense. Because like it can't be Grant, right? Like Alan no, Grant. No, yeah. it, wasn't. it was he was meant to be just a, a chef. Like the, the the resort chef, I think. Gotcha. I that think. makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He came coming in to like take his knives and clean his clean, go to the kitchen, or whatever, and comes across this horrendous uh, uh, scene with raptors chasing you. But at least he inadvertently saved your life. Killed him, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, they do, and that's when you guys escape. It's like, oh, he's eating him. We yeah, can they run. took yeah. him out. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> It wasn't too. P it wasn't PG enough. I guess not. <laughs> but I mean, the novel is pretty rated R, so I'm like, well, it kind of fits in that, right. you know, yeah, in that yeah, world yeah. at least. Right. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was just like, yeah, we don't need that bit. They just get out. <laughs> That's why, I like, reading the scripts too and seeing the storyboards to see, like, okay, like this is what it could have been. Like, these are the ideas that kind of went through it. Right. Oh, you know, I saved all my scripts, and it was all the different colors. You know the. The, the different, you know, the revisions. And I had a binder of them and <laughs> I gave it to my roommate at the time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I gave it to him, but I'm still friends with him, although I rarely speak to him, but I'm still friends with him. We keep in touch. And I know as he's a film director himself and a film buff. And that's why I gave it to him at the time. So I'm pretty certain, but I don't want to ask him because I don't want him to think, well, I want it back because I did give it to him in good faith. So um, I'm I'm assuming, I like to think, and maybe I'll ask him one day uh, if he still has it. But I'm, I like to think he still treasures it because I think he probably would. Oh, yeah. Essentially, he's involved in film and stuff. It's not like you just gave it to some guy that works at a restaurant or something. Right. Oh, right. here you go. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Someone that yeah. So I have somewhere that. out there, hopefully, is my copy of the whole script and all its, you know, revisions sitting in someone's shelf somewhere. I know you directly had an impact on a funny joke that's in the movie. I know you talked about this before um, when we talked to your husband, but yeah, so if you want to tell the story again, just to, just for fun. Well, yeah, so um, so uh, it was my dad and he actually still has the, he still has the original fax, copy of the fax. I, I guess he had the foresight to remember to keep it, but um, he sent me a joke. He faxed me a joke in the art department <laughs> and uh, that he had heard. It was like a dad joke. And um, what do you call a, uh, I never remember the joke, what do you call a blind dinosaur? A blind dinosaur. What do you call a blind dinosaur's dog? Um, and I was like, oh, that's great. So I was, I got the, probably got the fax at work because he would have sent it to the, because I didn't have a fax machine. He probably sent it to the art department and I was reading out this uh, fax, this joke. And to my right in the art department was um, Paul Sonsky amazing set designer and I told him the joke and he thought oh that's good and um, you should tell Stephen I went oh, Lee he said yeah you should still tell Stephen and I think probably Stephen was like there that day so uh he, he and and because my desk was right by the door to the art department so one day you know that day or that afternoon Stephen you know came through and walked in front of me or as he was leaving and I said oh hi because I knew I knew him at that point I said hi I have a joke he said oh okay so I told him the joke and he said, do you mind if I write that down and maybe I'll put it in the movie? I said, OK. So so there it was. He, he's a good guy. <laughs> no, that's I mean, that's amazing. That was, you know, something he actually considered. Like, that's, I guess, the kind of director he is where he'll consider yeah. any good idea that comes into. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That's and that's cool. a very memorable joke in the movie, like. You know, people always reference it all the time that right. are fans of Jurassic Park. Right, so, right. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's just one of those it's those weird things. My, you know, just just sort of, hey, hey, I have a joke. My dad sent it. <laughs> My dad told me a joke. It's literally a dad joke. <laughs> literally a dad joke. So we could all thank your dad for the dad joke. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Because I know you guys have like a framed copy of the David Kep script page where the joke is in it so yeah that's, yeah. that's, that's the one that's the one part of the script i kept <laughs> <laughs> there is a scene in Jurassic park the movie um after the characters visit the raptor pen and they go into the visitor center to have lunch and right. they're all talking in this darkened room where there's these projectors projecting different stills on you know the background behind them to right. give some extra visual flair, of course. So yeah. it's not just a conversation. Um, and there's at one point, just like one shot in the movie, and you can't really see it too well in like the cropped widescreen versions. But if you know one finds like an open matte version, they could see it clear. Um, there's a picture of John Bell and you together. Yes. So what's the story behind that picture? For some reason, they gave the job to me. I wasn't in charge of it. We found someone else from the outside um, to kind of uh, be the the sort of production designer of that specific scene, the art director, as it were, as it were. And her name was Patty Podesta, and I knew her because she was also a teacher at an art center where I studied. Um, but she was also in the film business, so she was brought on. Uh, we brought her on to sort of take charge of that scene uh, because she had a lot of experience at the time mainly mostly probably because of the work she did at art center um with with projectors and slides and and how it all works with, within you know with the photographer and the you know the dp and the cinematographer and the lighting and all that stuff so she had had a, a handle on all that stuff so and i was basically working for her helping her put all that together and so the reason john and i are in that is because we were we were just trying to find lots of uh, imagery and create lots of imagery for those slides so uh, there's a picture of a before and after. So we posed in front of a wall, you know, at Amblin, and John's holding his tie up like this. And it was a, just a normal kind of blue tie. And I'm just sitting there with like holding a white mug. And then we sort of, we photoshopped the DNA strand onto the tie and the Jurassic Park logo onto my mug and added a background. And there was that photo. So there was a, there was a it was a homemade job and a lot of, you know, uh, as a, another art center friend of mine who was a um, who came on and helped uh, accumulate or do a, a lot of the sort of graphics Photoshop stuff for those slides because I was there on on working full time at Amblin 
I had to sort of arrange for the stage space and all the equipment and have all the the uh, duvetine hung around and all that stuff. So we'd had a there was a funny story that I remember the other day. <laughs> so I, I again because I was clueless. Um, I knew that we had to do a test and um, I that we had to get some some duvetine hung all around the stage and get some uh, projector in there and stuff. So I I called the grips at the grip department at Universal and I ordered uh, all this sort of equipment to roll in, you know, for this test of ours. <laughs> and like the next day I got this call from our U- UPM, Lata Ryan, um, s- chewing me out for like what did you do why did you know the stuff costs money you know and I just thought you just ordered it and it came and you know that it was all part of the same system I didn't understand there were different productions and you had to like you know have a purchase order and and uh, you know deal with it in that way I messed up a little bit with that but everything was fine so um but (laughs) I forgot I did that anyway it all worked out we had to get all these um uh the projectors and all the um screens and have all that put up and you know run this show patty did an amazing job and um it was it was cool so at the end of the at the end of the day steven was was so happy with it that he sort of he stopped the crew and said i just want i just want everyone to know to give some thanks to these fine people who put this this slideshow together everyone you know a little round of applause oh "Oh, that's great (laughs) <laughs> and then Jeff Goldman po- piped up and he said, well, what about the actors? <laughs> <laughs> that's so, that's like, on brand with him. <laughs> I know. I was like, I know for, for years, I thought, what an ass, you know, what, is, what, a, what? but then now knowing Jeff Goldman, you know, that's the, that's the kind of thing he would say in jest. Oh, yeah. Jeff Goldman. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> what about the actors? <laughs> But I mean, to to be fair, like you know, his um, brand of humor wasn't well known until after the movie came out. Correct. So, there you go. Correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like, I understand why you'd be a little upset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was great. It was good. <laughs> you know, we were in at Universal when the crew was in Kauai, and there was a big storm, the big hurricane. So uh, that was a bit touch and go because you know. We didn't know how that, there was no communication for a, a while because all the all communications were down. So, uh, yeah, that was a huge thing for all them to deal with. They're all sort of holed up in a hotel, like, wait, waiting for this, you know, hoping that they weren't going to get sort of blown away. Yeah, it's interesting that you're on the other end of that to be like worried, like what what the hell is happening down there? Like, are is everyone OK? You know, like having yeah. that kind of concern and worry yeah Yeah, that's right right. wow not not to mention i mean obviously i wasn't there so i don't have a visual memory of of what damage happened but there must have been some significant damage to the construction what they were building so it may have delayed stuff i don't know probably did yeah from my understanding uh they only had like one day left of of filming and they just ended up scrapping that day and i guess they had enough of what they needed or they maybe cut out partially like a scene some people claim that there was supposed to be a scene where you actually see samuel jackson's character get ripped apart by the raptor right so that was something that they thought might have gotten cut so but yeah no one really knows for sure <laughs> one of the pictures that you sent me before that had like looks like a a dummy of someone looks like donald gennaro the lawyer that gets ripped apart by the t-rex in the movie so what's the story behind this like mannequin stand in i guess uh that was that we had that sitting around the art department for ages um i think they had used it when he's sitting on the toilet and the t-rex comes and you know picks him up and chomps on him so that was from that particular scene and so they i think they must have used it as a stand-in for when this ginormous animatronic dinosaur (laughs) made by stan winston's guys came that they wouldn't want the real guy like because that thing was huge so uh yeah so that was there in, in his full like ah it's coming to get me <laughs> no that see I, I don't think anyone really knew that something like that existed for because in the final movie it's a cgi t-rex that ends up you know grabbing him and right. taking him off the toilet so do you know if they ever right. filmed it with the animatronic first to see if that i'm would assuming work? that i you know i don't know um i'm assuming, assuming they must have either planned on doing it given it a go i don't know someone on on actually you know more qualified than myself would be able to tell you that 
but oh, I'm, ass- okay. <laughs> I'm assuming it was a plan to use it at some point. They made this full size, you know, exact copy of the actor. And it was very rubbery. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's why I was like so interested in it because I'm like, it's not just like a, oh, a generic dummy kind of thing. It does no, look it, just like it him. Was, yeah. yeah, it was definitely modeled off him. He probably, it was probably made by the, I don't know, maybe the Stan Winston people may have, may have taken a, you know, a cast of his face uh, or modeled it from him. I'm sure you guys played around with it all the time. Like, oh, here's this dead guy in the office. <laughs> right, <you know>? Yes, yes. <laughs> Throw him around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's looking a bit concerned, you know. <laughs> Should someone help him? <laughs> Amazing things was just to kind of see all this stuff as it, uh, you know, was evolving. They had like a screening for, you know, Amblin crew people one day in the, in the Amblin screening room of the first sort of official dinosaurs. So that they had um, the big brontosaurus walking across the screen and we were all sitting down waiting like what's this going to be like and then you could see the audible sort of sort of wonderment of everybody as they as these dinosaurs came walked across the screen in this you know fairly small uh screening room at amlin it was amazing to be there to like be there it's like it, it was a little piece of history right there for you know <laughs> for cgi nerds i guess you were there to see the first moments like that is really special it was it was amazing it was amazing yeah i i was um i you know they would always hold have dailies every day obviously when they were shooting and i would often pop in um because they would have them in the ambulance screening room and i would just sneak in and have a look and you know have a watch the dailies and see what it was looking like as they were shooting so um yeah i i was uh very fortunate very fortunate so what other films did you work on during or even after the time of Jurassic Park for like Amblin and Universal? Uh, well, as I said, it was uh, we did Jurassic Park followed by Death Becomes Her followed by Jurassic Park. And then after that, um, Rick went off to do Forrest Gump, I believe. And I stayed. He foisted me back onto uh, Bill Sandell, who came in to do the Flintstones. So I basically stayed put at Amblin. Um, and we, then we did, um, you know, however long that was, another long run. So that was cool because I got to see, you know, all those Flintstone props and all the sets being created. Every single thing had to be built. Every piece of set dressing, every car, everything. So uh, that was a big project. Oh, yeah. I mean, for ages, because I've, I've gone to Universal Studios many times, you know, to the park. And they used to have like the sets or like props and some of the vehicles of Flintstones like on the studio tour after the movie came out. And yeah, yeah. it was so great to see like all how much detail, you know, that they had and everything. The little the rock motifs, you know, so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a, a huge amount of people had to had to come on come on board for that. Just just as far as all the sets. Oh, that's great. Did, did you sneak in any Jurassic Park references in the Flintstones or like, you know, did, did anyone sneak any like Jurassic references since it was closely related? <laughs> Probably subconsciously more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was a dinosaur in the Flintstones, di- uh, the pet dinosaur, Dido. Everyone's all part of the same kind of like, OK, here we go. And I, you probably can't help but include some of it just because it's in in your head. By the end of the Flintstones, I realized I, I couldn't or didn't want to be an art department coordinator anymore. Uh, I really wasn't cut out to be an art department coordinator. And so I started taking set design lessons. And um, so by the time the Flintstones finished, I was already starting to learn to draft and try to sort of, you know, change course a bit. Well, I mean, it's a good place to learn, you know, who you are. Like, what better place than, you know, in that studio? It was a... Uh... A good place to realize that you're you're not as important as you think you are when you come out of college, especially Art Center College of Design, where you graduate thinking you're something special, and then you get out there and it's like, oh, okay, all right, uh, I've got a little. You sort of start down, <laughs> take myself down a few notches, and um, uh, yeah. But it was an amazing, yeah. I, without even realizing it, I was learning a lot about the business. I had no idea about I didn't know what I didn't know and so well I can imagine it being like a humbling experience and just kind of 
you know, the sometimes harsh realities of what a job really is, right? I mean, I think a lot of people could, you know, relate to that with other fields of work too, where it's like, this isn't what I expected, like, right. you know. Yeah, absolutely. It was definitely that. It was definitely um, very humbling. And uh, again, I just, I was so lucky. I was so lucky. What are some recent films that you've worked on? Last year, I worked on the Zack Snyder's new film that's in post-production now, Rebel Moon. So it was- Oh, wow interesting to see what that looks like that was huge that was a huge a huge endeavor with lots of sets so um but you know now that I've been working from home basically since COVID I don't really see the day-to-day comings and goings anymore which is a shame because it's like you're kind of stuck in your own little world you know you can look onto the server if there's like a, a Dropbox or a server that they're storing everybody's work and you can kind of if you have a time you can kind of browse through and see what everyone else is up to get some idea of what's you know what's going on and context and all that stuff so yeah it's a shame that it kind of boxes you in more you know literally and i'm sure you do a lot of zoom calls like this <laughs> just to get the movie made right that's right yes that's right oh, man. yeah i i i'm not sure how it would be how it must be a very different experience for people coming into the business now especially young kids who want to just sort of you know meeting everybody from all the different departments and you know, now it's so much more, everything's so organized into, you know, whatever, what what color your badge is. If you're red, you can go everywhere, but only a few people can go everywhere because that's the actors and they're, you know, they're vulnerable because they don't wear masks. So whatever, it's got to be very difficult, a, a different for for the people trying to get in and trying to learn the ropes and get and get meet people. So. Yeah, I mean, that makes you even more lucky that, you know, you came in at a time where it wasn't, crazy like this right, right now able to enjoy it more right yeah I mean we would see I would sit at my desk and we had John Williams was in the next bungalow so we'd see him kind of wandering around and then the uh, editor what's it, the famous editor is it Michael Kahn he was editing like in the, the a couple bungalows away and so I kind of for some reason I had to go in and look over his shoulder one day at something maybe it was to do with a slideshow um or make notes about something so you know it was all it was all this kind of little world that you could kind of um see and learn and meet and all sorts of things so and then that, because it was amblin you'd see all sorts of people coming in we weren't the main amblin building we were like the the bungalows next door but i would go into the main building quite a lot usually to go to the kitchen to get some bagels one day i saw antonio banderas nobody knew who he was really, but I watched some of the uh, his Amaldivar movies. And so I knew who he was. And he was this young kid with his, like, he looked very European. He had his little uh, denim, I think he had his light denim jeans and his light denim jacket and a little 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 European rucksack. And he was waiting <laughs> in the lobby to have some meeting. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Do you remember what else was filming at the same time as Jurassic Park on the lot? No, I actually <laughs> can't. <laughs> you were that focused. That's good. That's good. <laughs> well, I just remember this. So we had all these big stages and everything else was like, probably there was a, some TV shows like, you know, maybe it was the one with Angela Lansbury was Murder, She Wrote or something. I don't know. Because we'd taken over all these giant stages, everything else just seemed to sort of unimportant by by our standards right it's terrible terrible to say (laughs) no but you all knew what you were working on just like rick said he's like this is gonna be a big movie so everything out of the way (laughs) big way way for us (laughs) yeah bring the bring the john bulldozer in and we'll just (laughs) okay so i i have to ask because seamus blackley who for those not in the know he created the xbox and also created the uh, legendary Jurassic Park game Trespasser, which we all love. We all love here. So it's great. So how did you meet Seamus Blackley? Like, how did that, how did that happen? We met at a coffee shop. Uh, we we um, first met at Intelligentsia, and <laughs> very uh, hipster coffee shop. And, um, you know, he just, uh, just, we just really hit it off. We really hit it off and had suddenly realized we had all these kinds of, um, We'd never met, but we had all these these things in common. And um, when we were first dating, I was I had an old friend of mine who I was um, visiting, who lived in Venice, an old friend from college called Jared. And I was visiting his house in Venice, and we were I was 
sitting sitting in the front yard talking to Seamus uh, to, uh, on the phone. And I said, yeah, I'm at my friend Jared's house. And Seamus used to live in Venice at some point. So I said, oh, didn't you li- used to live in Venice? He said, yeah, I lived on, you know, whatever the street was. I went, oh, yeah, I'm I'm on that street. I'm, a, you know, I'm a, like, the, I gave him the number in the cross street. He said, what? Is that the house with the, you know, with the, with the fluorescent light in the bathroom with the, you know, on the wall, the fluorescent wall? I went, yes <laughs> so it just turned out that my friend jared is living in the house renting the house from this the same house that seamus had lived in like you know a decade or so before and just weird little coincidences oh of, wow yeah <laughs> i mean it's possible that he was working at dreamworks while i was at amblin it's possible I haven't quite figured out nailed down the dates but i remember when i was at amblin was when towards the end of my time was when they started forming DreamWorks and they had this other building that we all heard about. This other building was a place called DreamWorks and um, it's possible that Seamus was there at the same time. And we may have crossed paths without realizing, but um, yeah, <laughs> lots of weird little coincidences. Yeah, that might've been during the time that he was working on Trespasser, which was a very early DreamWorks game. Um, so it's funny that you guys have that Jurassic connection in a way too. So that's that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he's got his dinosaur collection, and I got mine. <laughs> exactly. But it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> no, exactly. No, you guys are great. <laughs> you know, it was a really good learning experience just to find out all the different positions of the art department, and and I I certainly did find out just because I was also blind to everybody and they were so talented and just watching these illustrators just create these amazing you know with a just with a pencil and graphite and and creating these amazing drawings diligently work on them on their desks all day David Lowry doing his storyboards I mean he's one he's the best storyboard artist in I think I've ever seen oh he's so good yeah he's great Uh, and he's so funny and we would have a lot of fun we would have a lot of fun so um yeah he seems like he'd be pretty rambunctious to to work with like his like style of humor and his energy so I'm sure you guys had a lot of fun yeah 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 thank you very much for doing this and long time coming I'm very glad we made this happen (laughs) all right thanks a lot Caroline Quinn's work on Jurassic Park helped shape the film into the classic it is today. Her entertaining recollections brought us back to that special time at Amblin Entertainment where dreams became reality. While her career blossomed into set design on many other incredible productions, her participation on Jurassic Park will always be greatly remembered. After 30 years, the film remains an incredible experience, thanks to the team of creative geniuses that brought to life an adventure 65 million years in the making. If you'd like to learn more about the untold stories of Jurassic Park, please visit Jurassic Time, featuring John Hammond's memoir program, Rick Carter's illustrated audio drama, and much more. This has been Derek Davis.